Hello everyone, this is Katie Phillips from TOSA Together. Welcome to a TOSA Talks, Building a Diverse Thriving Community, an ongoing Facebook Live series proudly sponsored by our generous friends at Bostic. TOSA Talks features three monthly presentations designed to provide meaningful discussions around racial and social justice issues to support the work of building an inclusive anti-racist community. Tonight's talk is titled Wisconsin's Indian Country. We welcome and encourage you to take part in the live Q&A session tonight. Please be part of the conversation by adding your questions and comments for our speaker into the Facebook comment section during the presentation. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's host, Rebecca Salauda. Good evening. And I am very excited tonight uh, because we have a very special guest. Uh, Jenny Monet is an investigative journalist, media critic, and founder of the weekly newsletter, Indigenously Decolonizing Your Newsfeed. It is a uh, weekly newsletter that I strongly re recommend that everybody subscribe to um, because it provides a host of information. Uh, Ms. Monette has been reporting from Indian country for as long as she's been a journalist, from the coup d'etat in the Apache lands in the late 90s to the dramatic demonstrations at Standing Rock a few years ago, where she was arrested while on assignment and later acquitted. At every step, telling the story of the indigenous people has been a struggle to fit the colonized press often dismissed as activism rather than sound journalism. Ms. Monette has been working independently since 2015, where her award-winning reporting has been published by such outlets as Los Angeles Times, The Guardian, the Center for Investigative Reporting, and PBS NewsHour, just to name a few. Her media criticism has also appears frequently in the Columbia Journalism Review. At times, she can also be seen discussing indigenous affairs for MSNBC, Democ Democracy Now!, and NBA. NPR news stations. She holds an MA in international politics from Columbia Journalism School and is a member of the Indigenous Media Caucus. So with that, well, and I could go on for the next hour talking about all of her accomplishments, but we want to actually hear from her. So with that, welcome, Ms. Minette. Oh, well, thank you so much, Rebecca, and thank you for uh, Tosa Together inviting me to this uh, conversation tonight. It's an honor. Well, thank you. So I wanted to start out uh, our discussion tonight uh, with how this week started out uh, in politics, and that is with the historic nomination and confirmation of Secretary Holland. Um, yes. It's my understanding that uh, she and you are both uh, members of the Laguna Pueblo Nation and that you have ha have a history of having followed her um, followed her career. So what what to you is the significance of her being uh, the Secretary of the Interior? Well, thank you so much for um, acknowledging that historic leap for all of Indian country this week. Um, it's certainly on the minds of pretty much everyone across Indian country. <laughs> um, it, it, some people have, um, you know, described this moment akin to an Obama-esque kind of leap. Um, and I would say that there's some truth to that if you look at the the parallel histories and stories of um, Deb Holland and Barack Obama both come from very humble beginnings, um, you know, have hearts of community organization and activism behind them, and, you know, have really risen um, as a voice of the people. Uh, and that is very true for Deb Holland. You're right in saying that we are uh, from the same Laguna Pueblo. Uh, the Laguna Pueblo is one of nine, uh, one of 19 
um, Pueblos in the state of New Mexico and one of 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States. And um, I, what's significant about seeing someone who looks like me in that position, I think is what's most powerful um, is to hear her speak our native language, which is Kara's, um, many times over in the time that not only she's been one of the first native congresswomen um, in Congress, along with Sharice Davids, um, who's Ho-Chunk in Kansas, but you know, in her historic confirmation hearings, um, that we saw two weeks ago and now her vote, it's just been pretty profound um, to, to hear those ancient languages spoken in a government that has been not only just unkind to indigenous peoples, but um, whose mission it was, was to exterminate us. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> so specifically, that she is the Secretary of the Interior. What is that particular role important? Having having a an indigenous woman at the head. Yeah. So, two. There's two parts to that, right? Because um, she she's not the first woman to head the Department of the Interior. Um, but she is the first indigenous person to take the helm of this agency, which for over 180 years since its inception has been um, targeted around um, the seizure of indigenous lands, um, the, the assimilation of indigenous peoples, and basically the eradication to eliminate the treaty obligations that are linked to those lands, the foundation of this country. Um, before it was called the Department of Interior, it was called the Department of War. And in fact, in this week's newsletter, I intend to kind of dip back into that first real um, nascent history where we look at the history of the cabinet, which happened under George Washington. There were only four secretaries at that time. And one of them uh, was General Henry Knox, whose very job it was as Secretary of War was to basic, he was also a vicious land prospector. And um, there's an incredible story about his um, seizure of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the lands that we today call Maine and how that story is still, what happened to those lands in that first cabinet um, is now before um, a very important court decision in the first circuit today, um, centered around these very same questions that we're seeing play out in Wisconsin, in Oklahoma, in New Mexico. I mean, it's, it's profound to see the through lines of time. Um, and that is, that's what I think lives at the heart of the indigenous struggle. So um, you said one thing, and I just want to get sort of take a sidetrack uh, and help explain to our audience and then continue on. Um, you said that there were 19 pueblos and I lost track of the number of nations. Can you define those for us or explain what the difference is? Oh, for sure. So there's 574 federally recognized tribes across the United States. And that number fluctuates anytime another nation that may have been attempted to be erased by the federal government has clawed itself back to basically back to life. Um, that's part of the indigenous experience um, is fighting their erasure. Um, and so we're now at 574. Um, the Pueblos, as I mentioned, there are 19 Pueblos in the state of New Mexico. And we have a different story, a different colonial history than the rest of the United States. Our colonization is a Spanish um, uh, legacy where technically, if you really talk to historians, um, you know, there's case law that argues whether or not we were technically reservations, but obviously we, um, have the nation to nation relationship that the rest of Indian country has. And I think that that's, if you're, if you look at the legal definition of Indian country, 
It's um, who has that nation to nation relationship with the federal government. And if you parse it even further, it's who has the, um, the trust lands, you know, with um, that define Indian country because uh, you have a lot of tribal community and urban centers like Milwaukee, like Minneapolis, like Albuquerque, uh, but they're not necessarily reservations today. They're urban large populations that we also consider Indian countries. So there's these two um, definitions, but um, what sets apart these tribal communities like the Pueblos versus say uh, Wisconsin tribes has everything to do with our language, our cultures, our protocols of how we govern predating colonization, even among the Pueblos themselves, even though we have kind of a distinct identity of, um, you know, even cultural identities, when you start to parse that out Pueblo by Pueblo, we're very unique and distinct. And I think um, if you got all the Pueblos together and tried to say that we were some kind of monolith, <laughs> you might get a few people riled up over that. <laughs> well, thank you for that explanation. Sure. Um, so uh, you, you started to talk a little bit um, about, uh, you know, the history uh, of, of the Department of Interior previously, the Department of War, um, you know, I guess, uh, as, as I understand from reading some of your writing and, and others who've been reading about uh, her historic appointment who have also taken that historical look, that, um, you know, the, the change was, oh, we'll put it in domestic and then we'll try and pretend that they're all white or will force them to be white um, to, a, as you've been saying, to erase uh, their identity. Um, so we have been, but there's these treaties and the treaties were made. There's, there's a lot of fault. There's a lot of problems. You know, we criticize uh, today uh, a lot of the racism that went into those treaties, but there were treaties between nations, nation to nation um, agreements that um, that that uh, are are still relevant and are still coming to the courts. And so you mentioned uh, one in the First Circuit, which is you know Maine and in that area. Uh, but there's also been one here in the Seventh Circuit, um, and the Seventh Circuit encompasses Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. But it had to do with um, Northern Wisconsin. And so bringing it into, you know, the title of our topic today being uh, Wisconsin's Indian country. Uh, what can you tell us about that decision? Yeah, so um, Wisconsin is home to 11 federally recognized tribes and one state federally recognized tribe. So you have a total of 12. Um, and the difference between the state and federal really has to do with um, the, the federal trust relationship that we were talking about, that nation to nation. It's not as solidified, um, especially when it comes down to funding and also when it comes down to um, defending treaty rights and the government honoring those treaty rights. And that really is the difference. Um, but in the case that we're talking about in Wisconsin, it has to do with the Oneida Nation, which is near Green Bay. I think most people recognize it as the tribal territory near Green Bay, Wisconsin. And um, the case is called Oneida versus the village of Hobart. And for, uh, for years, the village of Hobart um, had been operating as its own municipality uh, within Oneida um, historic treaty territory. And the Oneidas have long had to um, fight for the rights to that territory against, as you know, the village of Hobart, which is very wealthy, very small. Um, and it, the, the now, fight boiled over. I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm assuming not populated necessarily by indigenous people. But That's by right. But yes, I was just going to get to that. If you look on a map and you look at where the village of Hobart is today, where we look at the defined treaty territory, 
country. The village of Hobart is like an island in a sea of Oneida territory. And that is the case today, jurisdiction wise. And that became this brutal um, jurisdiction war property battle that one public radio host described it as thorny and volatile as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. <laughs> Obviously not as violent, but as um, deeply entrenched in views and, um, and in um, the political rhetoric that aligned with it. And it, it went to the first, it went to the district courts and actually the Oneida Nation lost appealed and the first circuit heard the case in i want to say april 2020 mm -hmm. and what happened and then it got decided on in july of 2020 and what happened in between that time was very significant a, a historic supreme court case that happened in june 2020 known as mcgirt v oklahoma which was an almost identical case that was a crime, it, it was a criminal justice uh, case on its on paper, but it really had to do with who had jurisdiction to investigate crimes on tribal lands. And the argument was whether or not Oklahoma's treaty territory still stood. Did it survive this era we know as allotment, the allotment era of the 1880s that carry us up until around the 1930s? And in that period of time, it's, it was basically Western expansion free for all. And um, even though the government was parceling up indigenous lands for um, indigenous peoples to become independent property owners, even though they were, uh, you know, this organized system, the goalposts kept changing. The, the land just kept getting, you know, lost to graft and to um, all kinds of nefarious, you know, wild activity. And, but those treaties still held. And the mess, this, we're now coming to like reconcile with the mess that was left after, you know, 100 years ago, over 100 years ago. And the big message behind that is that no, the treaties never expire, the deals made still stand. And what I think is so profound in the McGirt decision that stays with me in terms of pretty much everything we look at when we look at indigenous affairs in America is what uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch, who wrote the opinion says that, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something to the effect that, you know, we wouldn't allow this kind of lawlessness to exist in any other capacity in the United States. Why, why are we allowing it to happen when it comes to federal Indian law, to Native Americans, to, to these historic pacts? And I just think that that is what lives at the center of the McGirt decision. And it was to no surprise by observers of Indian country when the Oneida v. Hobart decision became the first case following McGirt um, to be decided on that Supreme Court case. And of course, it went in favor of the Oneida nation. And I think to the surprise of the village of Hobart, who today, as I said, remains this island within um, historic treaty territory of, um, of the United Nation. So what, what benefits, um, I, I, you know, I, after the McGirt decision came out and I had followed that because um, it was fascinating, um, just learning about the history and, and, you know, what led to it. And we could do a whole long thing on, on the whole allotment and, and how yeah. truly <laughs> racist and crazy that was and how, you know, people were, you know, um, land was literally stolen from people. These were not fair, like, oh, you want to sell? Well, I will give you a fair price. It was. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, and so after that came out, I, I was really trying and, and I understood the symbolic significance to being able to say, this is our land, these treaties still hold. Um, but I, what I was really trying to figure out is, is practical. What, how does this change the life? So from your understanding from the Hobart decision, how does that change the lives um, of the uh, people of the Oneida Nation? Well, it, tremendously actually, for one, any time the a court, which 
it's a it's it's kind of a double edged sword, right? Natives don't want to go to court because it could return really dire results. But then on the flip side of that, if a court actually affirms and upholds these treaty rights, um, the staying power of those victories are so strong. And they're not just strong just for the winning tribe in the court. In this case, the Oneida Nation, it sets precedent across Indian country. And that was why McGirt was so profound is because, um, you know, um, Riaz Kanji, the uh, lead attorney who behind the McGirt decision, his first quote out of the gate after that historic victory was that we will be citing the McGirt decision for time immemorial, the way that we have a lot of other historic Supreme Court decisions that have defined federal Indian law. And that's what lives um, you know, at the heart of tribal sovereignty today is that our, our laws, our systems, our sovereignty is not new and it's not, it predates the United, you know, the United States government. Um, one of some of the first founding laws of this country are because of the extinguishment of Aboriginal title and and constructing the United States system around uh, what to do with Native Americans as 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 recognized sovereign governments, and so um, you know it's just uh, part of this um, downbeaten legacy that we have been forgotten, that we have been systemically um, you know positioned to be. Um, disappeared, erased, um, you know, assimilated and mixed, trying to meld us into um, the white civilized societies at every turn, at every turn. And it's, and it's been a plan that continuously has failed over and over again. And it's a pretty remarkable story. Yeah, yeah the, the, um... You know, there, there's talk, and, and I will share that TOSA together is working on um, on uh, having a uh, uh, land acknowledgement at the beginning of our uh, presentations. We're just trying to uh, do our homework first before uh, presenting it to somebody and getting some input. But one of the things that in, in doing that research has been, you know, I me as, as the attorney and the, the I want to talk about how horrible these people are is that, <laughs> and I, I still want to do that, but the, the importance that I'm hearing of really emphasizing the, this, what you were just saying, you know, indigenous people are still here, we're thriving, we're, we're moving forward. We, despite all the crap you've done to us, we're still here and <laughs> we still have, as you started off with saying the importance of Deb Holland talking in her native language, the importance of, of these customs and, and things going forward um, is, is just so powerful. And I think just, you know, keeping that at the forefront while also not forgetting, you know, the, the what, uh, you know, white America has done um, to indigenous people. Yeah, I think to that, and also your last question too about like what what does this mean for the Oneida, like victories like this and um, historic leaps like Deb Holland as Interior Secretary. I was having a conversation um, with a interview. I'm writing about Holland right now, and um, the woman I was interviewing is also Laguna Pueblo. Um, and just so, so overwhelmed with these steps and leaps that we're taking. And she said something that was pretty profound to me and it's simple, but I think still profound in that she said, you know, what happens next? Like this question mark of like, we've never been in, at this juncture before where we have had um, uh, such a high ranking, uh, indigenous-minded leader in, in positions of power that know our story, that understand us, not just understand us, is of us, and um, that, that has a clear, that has a clear and transparent agenda to, um, you know, rectify broken treaties, 
um, she's in that position. Like, I like how people are writing about her interior position because they're writing out about it in this way of, um, you know, that's removed of the treaties. Whereas when I look at it and when I write in my newsletter, I see her role as being the, you know, an indigenous, the first time we have an indigenous person whose very job it is, is to oversee the treaty obligations that are directly tied to unceded indigenous lands, lands that got turned into national parks, lands that got turned into public pastures for all kinds of things, grazing, oil and natural gas, our shorelines. And I mean, those, those aren't just lands that didn't belong to somebody. There were actual real policies at every turn. And now we have someone who's when she looks at the policy, when she looks at the, the, the timeline of understanding what to do, um, you know, it doesn't come without this, this deeply informed indigenous lens on it. And for all of us who are watching, like we have no idea what happens next because we've just never been in this position before. And it's just really incredibly exciting to imagine. And I think that's where we're all at right now. It's just this zone of imagining. That That's exciting. Um, <laughs> so, but maybe I'm just being the glass half empty person here, but a couple of things that, that come to mind when you're talking about, when we're talking about this and, you know, the McGirt decision and, um, the uh, Hobart decision and on all of those are incredibly important, incredibly powerful, and I'm glad the courts got them right. Um, but you know, it's going to take all of us making sure that not just the courts, but that the executive branches and the legislative branches follow through and support that. Because mm -hmm. you know, I, I think back to um, we're. I'm going to destroy the first name. Worcester, Worcester B. Georgia. Worcester, Worcester. Worcester B. Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, was, was a decision that came out during the Jackson administration and was supportive of, of um, treaty and indigenous treaty rights, indigenous rights, things like that. And, you know, Andrew Jackson said basically, you know, the Supreme Court wants to decide that, let them enforce it. And the result was the trail of tears and, and you know, the, the um, genocide of, of thousands of people. So, um, so court decisions are great. We also need to make sure that our legislative and executive branches are, are supporting those decisions. That's right. I think that's what's also so significant about um, not just having someone like Holland in a leadership position, but this past election, we saw a record number of Native Americans elected to office as well. And so the visibility factor has been um, maybe uh, as advantageous for us than it ever has been um, in terms of political representation. And when you have that kind of political representation, it has an incredible ripple effect across the board. Um, you know, I'm thinking at, in, um, for instance, in states like South Dakota, um, or uh, where there are a number of people who, uh, Native people who are now in serving in state offices there, or in Montana. These are challenging states that have long, you know, had anti-Indigenous policies to get at the land, to get at what lies beneath the land, oil, natural gas, uranium deposits, and at really brutal expenses of the Indigenous peoples who live on and near those lands. The most recent we saw with, is Standing Rock, which is continuing continuing to battle for those fights. And so, um, you know, they are, there are real impacts on the ground. And I think that the more that you have this kind of political representation, it starts to correct the maleducation that we as Americans have all endured in terms of not being taught these kinds of um, histories in our classrooms. It's not 
I tell everybody, it's not your fault that you don't have this store of knowledge, that you don't know about treaties, that you don't know about maybe your state's own history and the indigenous peoples you know, of those lands. Um, and that's a real disservice that we've done to every generation going through our education system. And I think that um, if we're starting, you know, if we're looking at the power of this political representation, I think that there's a collective um, agreement that the next big step needs to be building in that kind of curriculum in our schools um, for our for our kids, for the next generation, and which eventually meets in the middle, right? And we're no longer um, a community that doesn't understand or is too afraid to understand uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, my education, which was way back when, but both of my kids uh, are graduates, recent graduates um, of uh, the Wauwatosa school system. And they were definitely taught about the explorers. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't, you know, other than the fact that they themselves have interest and have, you know, sought out that sort of education. Um, I couldn't tell you that they were actually taught about uh, indigenous leaders and and the the people who lived here, um, you know, whose land that we are on, which is you know that that um, you know how many people know Wawatosa is uh, is a Potawatomi word. Um, I forget the exact translation. I know, but. It, essentially firefly um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and people will say oh isn't that quaint but not really realizing well what does that mean it means that where my building is sitting right now this is stolen land this is somebody else's place so all of these people you know we also are taught you know we kids read little house in the prairie i read it to my kids have to admit <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, because they were going off into there were these brave people going off into this wilderness where nobody else was. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that you know they were brave enough to conquer. You know that kind of you know I won't say it on the air storytelling <laughs> that, that goes on um, that that definitely needs to um, be corrected. And uh, actually, one of our uh, one of the people who's helping out tonight uh, just confirmed also as a uh, Wauwatosa graduate, she was not taught much regarding indigenous and Native American leaders. Um, so, mm -hmm. which, you know, and, and Tosa is better than many uh, school districts uh, on these issues. So, you know, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a critical point. I do. I think it's um I think it's just time too, right? You know, I mean, like even as I said, like five years ago, these conversations were hard to have. People weren't ready. The ear just wasn't absorbing it. And I think that people are just so hungry for that kind of knowledge. Um, I think um, for whatever political experiences people absorbed in the last four years, I think that triggered a lot of um, these kinds of conversations and certainly 2020 what we saw, which was impossible to ignore a lot of the inequalities and disparities that erupted um, in right of all kinds of conflict, um, the coronavirus, the death of George Floyd, um, the election. <laughs> I mean, those, there was just, it was so profound. And I think that we'll look back at 2020 for decades to come. Um, but, you know, with this, what you had to say about um, Wisconsin and Wauwatosa and Milwaukee, I mean, you could look across the straight, the state and everything is an indigenous place name and that's not a coincidence. Um, and in large part, it's not even honorable. It's, um, it's not honorable until you really start to um, own and respect the, the acknowledgement that it is stolen lands as you said, and that with those stolen lands came a lot of loss of life and hardship um, for centuries, not just at the time that the land was taken. And I think that Wisconsin um, made a profound statement in that in December of 2020, at the end of last year, they put out their climate uh, the, the climate task force put out their climate change report 
um, which is, I think, led by your Lieutenant Governor uh, Barnes. And it was pretty profound because it was the first time that I even have seen a state government task force or climate change report that came out with basically a land acknowledgement saying these lands of Wisconsin are stolen lands, but it didn't stop there. It actually had buy-in from the 12 tribes in the state who some were on the task force. And if they weren't on the task force, they were tapped to provide input about ancestral knowledges deeply connected to Wisconsin lands. Um, I'm thinking about wild rice beds, the Menominee Forest, um, how these kind of traditional knowledge systems feed into how to conserve, you know, these lands as we look into the future. And, um, and I put it in that, in that context because when we start to look at the Paris Climate Agreement, um, on a larger scale, which is, you know, looking to reduce emissions at, you know, by a certain timeline and having global buy-in. Indigenous peoples have been fighting for that same kind of rep political representation and say, and a seat at the table ever since we've been, you know, talking about this agreement since 2015. And there has been no acknowledgement to they they latch on there's a paragraph paragraph 135 I believe it is uh, where it specifically speaks about how traditional knowledge is going to be used to basically um, you know attack uh, the agenda the goals of the Paris climate agreement but to indigenous peoples these are their ancient ways of knowing and to to have that written in that document and not have representation at the table it's a really hard thing and so to see a state like wisconsin to best the paris climate agreement talks <laughs> uh, that's how i yeah exactly um it, i think that a lot of wisconsinites don't don't aren't aware of that either and but um i definitely wrote about that in a newsletter when i when it caught my attention about this climate task force report, I thought it was pretty profound. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, we're, we're getting a lot of bad press these days about Wisconsin politicians just not even hiding their racism anymore. Um, <laughs> but, <Sorry. laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, Governor Evers and especially the Lieutenant Governor Barnes, who, who led this task force, um, really get, uh, you know, on the one hand, I want to say they get credit, they get thanks for doing that. But it's, there's also some part of me that says, yes, but you should have done it anyway. So acknowledgement that they're doing what, what uh, others should be doing, maybe is a, a way to put it. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think indigenous peoples, um, you know, it, it's hard to say some in you know, some states that have rocky relationships, um, indigenous peoples have a way of transcending a lot of the, you know, cultural divides. You, you can't say entirely everywhere. Um, I mean, look at North Dakota over the Standing Rock pipeline that some would argue, you know, broaden the divide, unfortunately there, but, um, you know, I think that if Wisconsin is um, is a true place of looking at that. Um, other other states where there are large populations, like New Mexico, I think um, is becoming more and more progressive. As someone who grew up in New Mexico, um, it's just a really interesting thing to see when you look at the power of the indigenous voice. What I think collectively indigenous peoples represent. Um, as real caretakers and stewards of the land. And I think that what's so promising about Deb Holland, about the Biden administration, is that we're entering into a new era for all of us where we're looking at uh, what to, how we caretake of our shared planet um, moving forward in a way that we've never really looked at before um, with the kind of climate policy it up that a sitting president has prioritized. And I think that that's pretty, pretty exceptional and also allows us all something to imagine. Yeah, exactly. I'm also, so you talked about um, the uh, 
So the the power and the importance of uh, indigenous voices, and I'd like to turn that also to you know this past election. There's uh, been significant talk, and rightly so, about the power of the black vote, and particularly the power, importance, and work of black women, and and definitely um, they get a shout out. Uh, but you know, there's also been uh, a lot uh, of from indigenous voters that has in in a lot of places been ignored, um, and the power that that brought, uh, including in Wisconsin. And if you could talk about that, oh, the the voting story out of Wisconsin was is so interesting to me. And it's an, it did get some press. Um, Arizona got a lot more, but uh, so the takeaway of the native vote is similar in Wisconsin um, in that native voters turn out in record number and um, significantly contributed to flipping uh, what otherwise were Trump states or red states to either blue or purple states um, by significantly putting a dent in Trump's um, chances of winning this, this his re-election. And in large part, I think there's a number of factors. Um, one, you know, it's, I don't think that I'm say I don't think I'm comfortable saying that native voters flip the states, they're responsible for flipping all of the states and the states I'm talking about are like Arizona, um, Wisconsin, um, I think Michigan was another close state that uh, we saw turn significantly. I don't know that I'm so comfortable saying that these states um, flip the entire, you were flipped by entirely the native vote, but certainly if the native voters did not turn out the way that they did, I don't think that the states would have flipped. So um, there in Wisconsin, there was roughly what, a 21,000 vote lead um, for Biden over Trump. And in Wisconsin, the, Mono or the native voters represent roughly like a 17 to 18% voting block and Menominee, Menominee County was one that, I mean, was almost entirely for Trump. And in fact, when, if you recall, when three counties were um, under review by the Trump administration um, for um, some kind of illegalities, you know, alleged illegalities of voting, Menominee County, which is almost entirely comprised of Menominee Nation, um, was one of those three counties. And it was just pretty profound um, for Indian country to be on the outside looking in at that because um, no one could really recall, you know, in modern times when that has happened, where native voters have been so scrutinized for their voter turnout, which was also like a pat on the back for a lot of us that, you know, we, that there was such a force um, to be reckoned with. Um, but also uh, that it showed that I think what lives at the heart of voter turnout in 2020 for Native voters was this, this kind of real um, rejection of Trump, um, who was unkind to Indian country, essentially over the four years, um, mostly through vitriolic just um, behavior. Um, he was, he, he ridiculed our Powhatan um, leader, Pocahontas over and over again as a as a racial slur to a sitting politician, Elizabeth Warren. Um, he repeatedly denounced Columbus Day and on literally on Columbus Day, you know, vowed to never honor um, or vowed to never eradicate it and um, uphold Indigenous Peoples Day. And uh, you know, it was it just there were many other, I think. Um, <sighs> situations that he, you know, I, the day, I think no one will ever forget his, um, the, the disservice he did to our veterans, our 
Navajo Code Talkers who went to the White House um, to be honored and Trump turned that into another Elizabeth Warren slur fest. I mean, there were just so many things that were so off-putting to Indian country that I think that also led them to vote um, against uh, another four years under Trump. Um, but also more politically minded tribal leadership um, really faltered. Um, the tribal consultation, what lives at the heart of the nation to nation relationship between tribes and the federal government, that all but almost died under Trump, um, where you just had decisions that were being made and tribes, you know, really weren't having a say in anything. And it was a, seen as a real reversal. So um, yeah, Wisconsin has a pretty rich story that lives there. And I think that um, that's something that I think when the next election comes, it'll, it, it, it'll be one that we return to for sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I, to me, I mean, even though I, you heard it more in Arizona, it still seemed somewhat underreported. You know, I, I heard some CNN at one point was saying, oh, yes, there's this percentage of this and this percentage of this. And oh, there was some other percentage. I'm like, yeah, they called us something. Other I know who those other people were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had a list for um, black voters, Asian voters, Latina voters, something else, <laughs> white voters. I mean, it was, um, and you know, yeah, there was the other side saying, well, that doesn't mean that totally excludes you. Well, I mean, who else are you really excluding? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was pretty profound and Indian country did not miss a step in owning that. And, you know, what's so great about Indian country is that for all the horrific abuse that we've endured, what lives at the heart of the struggle is this just enormous sense of humor and pride and um, community that just comes together because uh, what that's all we've known is to overcome adversity. And, um, and so when you have something like that, just this perpetual prolonged, you know, invisibility, um, the internet has done wonders for us. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, speaking of just overcoming adversity and coming together, uh, you know, I think the, the story of, um, oh wait, uh, okay. The, the story of, of how uh, many of the uh, indigenous nations have come together and really overcome and protected their own through COVID has been pretty remarkable and, and uh, fascinating to watch. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be honest, I haven't heard as much uh, in Wisconsin. I don't know if you have, but, but across the country, there have there have been some interesting stories. Is there any comment you'd like to make about that? Yeah, well, you know, we're all kind of honoring the, and I say honor, meaning I think many people's minds are where they were a year ago and how dramatically their lives were shifting at this time last year. And for me, you know, when I look back at this virus and how it's impacted tribal communities, um, there's no doubt that it has really burdened um, tribe after tribe who lost language speakers, who lost elders, um, our culture bearers, um, and then just really has ripped um, families apart, you know, families that are living cross-generationally in homes, which is another factor of like how the virus got to be so bad in certain communities is because, you know, indigenously families are living together for a lot of different reasons, kinship wise, but also socioeconomic factors play into that. Um, and so I don't think that we've quite really understood just how, um, how dramatic the damage is yet. I think that people are still suffering. It's definitely tapered off. The vaccine is another kind of um, layer to this story. Indian country has, um, has 
been able to vaccinate their communities uh, faster in many ways than a lot of other state and county governments. And in large part, um, there was a really interesting story actually on NPR. Uh, this guy, Kirk Sigler, um, who I think is still based in Colorado, he's um, he's been covering Indian country for a long time. He gets it. And so, um, Rich, so few people get Indian country in the news business, but he gets it. And he, he called it just right. He said, you know, this vaccine story is one of really a roll of the dice. Um, tribes were kind of stuck between relying on the states of which they were in or um, going to the federal government for the vaccines. And many tribes went to the federal government through the IHS and the Health and Human Services Department directly. Um, and why that's a kind of roll of the dice is because both are kind of, you know, haven't been good in the virus. Um, there's been, you know, IHS chronically underfunded and a lot, a lot of um, um, struggle and strife came from that, from the coronavirus as tribes grappled with how to get PPE to their tribes, um, uh, care, low, you know, understaffing uh, was an issue. And so, and then the state and county governments are kind of hands off when it comes to um, patients who don't have health insurance and are dependent on IHS. So, um, Sorry, I just want to interrupt. You you mentioned IHS a couple of times. Indian Health Service, correct? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, Indian Health Services. Yeah, um, and if anybody knows anything about that, it's limited, right? Um, there are roughly 50 or so clinics across um, the United States and about 24 or 25 hospitals. I always they're always fluctuating, so that's somewhere around there, and. Um, in many ways, reservation-based natives uh, are very dependent on those clinics and hospitals, um, and they're treaty they're treaty protected hospitals. They're promised by the treaties. That's why we have IHS, but they're chronically underfunded, um, and they have been for some time. And so, it's always been kind of like a, po a policy problem because on the outside. It looks like we have this great health care. We've got this access to public health care that other um, Americans don't have. And But if they were to come and access and understand what that health care um, is and the value of that, there would be, I think, a different conversation. And the coronavirus laid bare a lot of the disparities that live at the heart of the corona or of the healthcare system that um, really contributed to the disparities we saw around coronavirus. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've seen statistics and I don't, I couldn't repeat it now, but um, about just the disparities of the, the spending per person mm -hmm. uh, for the Indian Health Service versus, you know, other public health service uh, right. resources. Um, so yeah, and one of the other things that I've seen um, is that that I really appreciated was just the the defense of their lands. Uh, you saw that in South Dakota and in other places where um, the indigenous peoples were like, "No, this is our land. <laughs> you can't come here. You keep your germy bodies away." Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, I I thought that that was. Um, really cool and and um was was showing uh sort of underscored that we're going to protect our community that's right that's right yeah no the tribes were first actually i want to believe that it was the macaw nation in well in washington very hot northern washington state they were the first to shut down their borders um mm -hmm. And I even want to say before the travel bans were issued in the United States, like they beat Trump to actually taking safeguards. <laughs> um, yeah, no, a true act of sovereignty, right? Right, right. Yeah. So um, so I'm just looking at, we have a, a couple of questions here that I want to take sure. before we get to the yeah. end. Um, so you likely discuss this more in depth in your newsletter, but what um, can people generally look out for in their news feeds? Oh, that's a good question. Um, 
it's uh there's a couple of places i would recommend for news i think um certainly as you start to look at um deb holland's trajectory there's uh indians.com it's spelled i n d i a n z with a z um, dot com indians.com uh has been doing native news for i'd say just over 20 years there and their main co-founder uh, his name is ac agoyo he has been covering the beltway for that entire time and uh it was really great to listen to him and talk with him in the lead up to um secretary holland's uh confirmation and nomination or um nomination confirmation because his his he's got this encyclopedic knowledge of of these players in washington that span each administration um and i i know enough to keep up with him but he's he is like a little google himself in all of this it's just um really great and so he's quick at getting a lot of like the insider washington news out that um is important to indian country so for beltway news i turn there um for like a lot of the other stuff it's it's been really hard for me um as a journalist i used to have a, a process where i i relied on google alerts a lot and would sift through the google alerts of who's doing what news and for a long time i'm talking up until maybe the last two to three years ago a lot of the news that was surfacing around us had to do with either very culture driven stories like around powwows or you know um, arts and crafts and you know just these really light uh, entry doorways into who we are as indigenous peoples, um, or really brutal, you know, poverty laced stories about death and dying and, you know, addiction. And, <laughs> and then there's the stuff in between, um, was pretty rare to find. Um, and that's slowly been changing. Um, you're really, you're really starting to see a hunger by American journalists in general, interested in understanding India country for the first time, I think in ways, um, in our modern time, uh, that's good. It's also becoming, uh, because of that hunger, uh, there's a lot of room for error. So you have to be really careful about what you're taking in. For instance, today, MSNBC posted something. They did an interview with the president of the Navajo Nation who went on MSNBC and said, I think it's great that Deb Hollins, the Department of the Interior, now I hope she makes her top priority getting the vaccines out to all of Indian country. And to anybody who's listening to that would just say, yeah, why not? That's great. But the problem is, is that Holland doesn't have any control over those vaccines technically because the vaccines are administrated through the, the Indian Health Service, as we've discussed, and that falls under the Health and Human Services Department, not the Department of the Interior. She has no say in what happens to those vaccines. She could advocate, but she doesn't have any political or government control over that. And I think that like having those journalists who are framing that and not catching that and feeding that out to the public, you know, the harm is minimal, but the, but the, but the um, staying power for people to kind of receive that and think that that's the truth is is actually really great. And that's um, that's just where I worry about a lot of the misinformation getting out there, um, which keeps me very busy a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously I, I would recommend uh, your newsletter and we'll make sure to put the link in the Facebook feed. Um, and uh, you've mentioned Indians.com. Uh, how about, uh, do you know, are you aware of any that would be more Wisconsin specific or other sorts of 
books. Um, I know one that I keep that I've started to try and read and I haven't finished, but gets recommended a lot is Indigenous People's History of the United States. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, I wish I knew more Wisconsin centric um, text or, or information. Um, and having been in Wisconsin and spent some time, um, I unfortunately did not get um, to, to the museum. I'm told there's a museum in Milwaukee that's pretty rich. Um, but yeah, you know, that's the other downside. It's like, there's not a lot of, I being in Wisconsin for a short time, I remember not really feeling like there was a lot to grab, um, you know, that was accessible. Um, but I can, I can take a look and see what my, what I might recommend. I know one book I, that's just come to mind, um, Ada Deer. A-D-A, -A, last name spelled Deer, D-E-R. I just, I think there might be an E at the end of her last name. So she was a former assistant secretary of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So she also worked, she was an interior bureaucrat, but in the sixties, she was a firecracker activist, Menominee activist who basically revived the Menominee nation, brought it back from basically death after termination. And um, she made and marked her political career off of that. She today, as we honor Women's History Month, um, she is one of those women that I think a lot of native people honor right now. And she has a book out um, it's pretty recent. The title is escaping me right now, but if you guys Google that name, Ada Deer Menominee, and you'll find that book, it's within the last couple of years. Um, it's on my very short list to read. And she's almost on her, you know, she's in her twilight years right now. So um, she's in your home state. If you could get her to come to Tosa together and talk to you guys sometime. <laughs> I bet she would love to, to visit with you. Yeah, I remember her name from my time at Madison, but um, I will look up that and also try and get that in our, our feed. So um, we are uh, coming to an end uh, of our talk. And so first of all, I would like to thank you uh, very much uh, for your time today. Um, and this has been uh, an really uh, helpful and important topic. Um, so big thanks uh, from all of us. Um, and uh, so also would like to uh, thank you all for, um, in addition to, uh, thanking you for today. I'd like to uh, thank you as well for um, everyone for attending and invite you to attend next week uh, when we will be taught next Thursday when we will be talking with Sean Rowland, who is our county supervisor representative for uh, Wauwatosa as well as on the school board. I keep wondering when the man sleeps because he Neither of these are his full-time jobs because he has one of those two and he has a family. And I, like I said, don't know when he sleeps. Um, so we will have a chance to talk to him and also would very much like to thank Bostick, uh, our sponsor who has uh, provided funding for this program and has allowed us to go forward. So thank you all. And especially thank you, Jenny. And I hope we can uh, talk again. Oh, well, thank you so much for the invite. Went too fast. <laughs> yes, yes. Like I said, I think any one of these topics we could have spent a day on and we had to cram it all into an hour. So we'll uh, try and fill uh, the, the Facebook feed with a lot of other resources um, because I think, you know, one of the other resources I would say is just going to the, the web pages of, of some of the tribes because that has been... Um, yeah they have a lot of information about their own history. Yes, that is true. All right, well, thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, good night.